Hey everybody, this is Sheets, and we're going to take a look at this weekend's UFC card from a DFS perspective. And as you guys know, I break the DFS analysis down into two separate videos. Today we're going to go over specifically just who the best plays are. We're going to go through kind of fight by fight and talk about who's got the most upside, who's who are the best plays relative to their salaries and plays that we're going to be probably putting in our lineups. However, that does not end the discussion, and uh, we're going to be doing a second video completely de dedicated to advanced lineup construction, where we talk about how to use the different optimizers, how to attack this particular slate with respect to using contest sims and things like that. As you guys know, you know I, I feel as though there's a huge difference when you're playing DFS between knowing who the best plays are and how to actually play them. And I feel it's important enough to separate them into two completely different videos. And I usually wait until as late as possible to do that so that the ownership is a little bit tighter and, uh, you know, everything's settled in just a little bit more. Nonetheless, uh, let's get after it for uh, today. First thing is that it is a 13 fight card, which is very important because unless something gets canceled, that means that you are going to have to prioritize upside. It's not going to be enough to come up with, you know, with just six winners. Um, you, even your underdogs, you're going to need to prioritize ceiling. The other thing, which is kind of fun, is that because it's 13 fights, you don't have to go too ballistic. In other words, you, you don't have to employ what I like to call lineup funny business <laughs> when it comes to construction. And we'll get to that when we do the lineup construction video. When you sometimes have these 11 fight cards, in, in the in the quest to be unique, you end up having to do geo mean filtering or leave money on the table and do all kinds of funny business to not just play good plays, but also really just make a lot of sacrifices in the names of being in the name of being unique. Thirteen fight card, yes, you still have to you know try to be different, but it's not as hard to be different on a thirteen fight card. Let's just leave it at that. So let's uh, with that in mind. You know, we, we are looking at these fights from a perspective of upside, meaning that you're, you're looking for a couple of things. Number one, uh, if you have good line value, obviously that's pretty good. But you want to find fighters that in their wins are going to score. OK, we don't care necessarily whether they are whether they are going to win. That's already been factored into the price. But we have to figure out which fighters, when they do win, we're pretty sure they're going to score well. And that means we want fighters that are going to either finish or grapple the hell out of the opponent, okay? Um, now, again, we're not talking about leverage or anything like that. That's for construction, all that stuff. We'll get into a little of that, but we're just looking for the best plays, meaning who's going to finish, who is going to wrestle, who's going to wrestle and finish, right? Um, and which underdogs in their wins are going to either finish or are going to wrestle. Okay. And that's essentially what you're what you have to do in DFS in, in DFS uh, uh, MMA analysis. So let's just get right into it. So the first fight of the night, we have Peterson versus Pogues, uh, 8,700 versus 7,500. And the first thing you do have to double check is if there's any big line value. And there isn't. You have Peters sitting at 163, which is pretty much what he should be um, given this price. So there's no edge there. However, um, Let's take a look at the inside the distance lines. So inside the distance line for Peterson is plus 140. And that's actually pretty good for his price. Um, I just, you know, I, it's it's kind of really not 100% accurate. Uh, I sort of made it up. But what I, what I like to, to think about is if a fighter is 9K uh, or 9,100, I want them to have an inside the distance line of, my, of maybe minus 110. So I kind of, you know, extrapolate from that as the price goes up or down. So at 8,700, I expect him to have about a plus 140 inside the distance line to be a good play. And he does. However, in addition to that, he's got an extreme amount of takedown upside. I mean, he's got, you know, a lot of takedowns in his regional tape. That's what he tries to do. And not only that, but he goes for the ground and pound when he gets the takedowns. And with these heavyweights, I've just seen it happen a lot, you know, Yes, it could be a real ugly kind of clinchy fight, but if he does get those takedowns, these these heavyweights don't get up all too easily. So what ends up happening is not only you get the takedowns, but you get like all kinds of ground and pound. And those those are the avenues to like 130 here, like 120. Now, I'm not saying that Peterson is necessarily going to win. I mean, he's going to win probably what? Um, 
about 60% of the time, something like that. But the thing is that when he does win, he's really got a big ceiling uh, for his score. So he's a very, very strong play kind of right off the bat. Um, Pogues, on the other hand, it's not quite as, as appealing. I mean, he's, he's not going to garner all those takedowns and, and wrestling upside. If he wins, it's going to be either by decision or by a striking base KO. So while we don't want him in a, in a decision, right. Cause we want upside. Uh, you really just have to look at his inside the distance line to see if he's playable and Pogues inside the distance plus 475 is just not good. So Pogues is going to be a fade for me. Now, again, that doesn't mean that um, when we get into leverage and things like that, he might not be a good play because if it turns out that Peterson's really, really chalky, then you might be able to make a case for Pogues to have some leverage, but that's going to be for the next video. But Peterson right off the bat, extremely strong play given his win condition. Uh, Medeiros versus Quinones, 8,500 versus 7,700. I think there was some line movement there, but let's check that. Yeah, so I guess some money has come in on Quinones a little bit. Not, It's not overwhelming, though, but yeah, I guess Quinones does have a little bit of line value. But again, in a 13-fight in a card, playing a, a fighter just because he's got a little line value is just not going to be good enough. And he's got to... Got to have a lot of upside to go with that. So let's just take a look. Um, inside the distance, let's look at both these guys. Medeiros inside would be plus 150. It's actually pretty good, right? But if you look at this line over here, it's more like plus 190. So it's just, I guess, fair. It's the best way I could describe it. You know, he's, he's only 8,400 plus 190. I guess it's reasonable. All right. Again, I'd rather just pay up an extra 200 for Peterson if you want to know the truth. But doesn't he? Medeiros is a terrible play. He's just pretty, you know, kind of average at best. Quinones on the other side, um, he, let's take a look at his inside the distance line. Uh, where is it? Quinones inside the distance plus 370 or so. It's, it's not that great. It just really isn't. I think both these fighters are just kind of very average plays at best, and they would not be priorities. Now, again, they, they both rumble. They both you know, are, are very are very active. So, yeah, I mean, you can make the case that if this you know this fight could go off, but based on the metrics and the most likely outcomes, uh, this fight is probably less appealing. If anybody in this fight would 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 you know make my lineups, I guess it would be Quinones again because you're always kind of looking for decent underdogs, um, but I think overall, I think we'll be able to even do better as far as that's concerned. Julia Stolyenko versus Luana Carolina. Very interesting fight here uh, from the from the you know perspective of win condition. You know, you have an even fight, right? 8,200 AK. And you look at the money line, you know, maybe Stolyenko is a slight favorite, but not by much. But when you look at the inside the distance line and the win condition, you look at Carolina. I mean, she never finishes anybody and she doesn't wrestle. So her win condition is extremely poor. On the other hand, you have Stolyarenko, who, despite being a pick em, she's like basically plus 140 inside the distance because I, all of her wins are basically first round submissions. So it's, uh, it's, it's, a situation where if you're going to play anybody, you're going to play Stolyarenko, and 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 uh, she becomes a really really elite play. Now it's a very scary play to make because she really only has one method of victory, and that's kind of by armbar. Um, but listen, at eighty two hundred, if she does get that first round submission, you're just going to want it, right? So she becomes a play you're just going to have to prioritize whether you like it or not. And Carolina, again, you might be able to play her for leverage, but just on the metric, she's just really just not a good DFS. Uh, Jake, uh, Jake Lee, uh, Jung Young Lee versus Blake Builder, 8,300 versus 7,900. So expecting about a pick of money line, which you are getting. Uh, well, actually, Lee's got a little bit of line value maybe because he moved up to minus 145, but not enough to just make him a play. Let's take a look at the inside the distance line. Um, builder inside the distance is terrible. You know, plus 300. He's not, not worth playing. 
Uh, young Lee is like plus 200. So that's actually okay. You know, we'll compare him to say, what was Madero's, for example? Was he like plus 200? He was actually a little better. So between these two, I actually don't even think Lee is as good as even Madero's. Uh, unless Lee's got some kind of advanced takedown upside that I'm not aware of, which I don't think that's the case. I think if anything, Builder might have the takedown upside. Um, I think that, again, this this fight is one of the less appealing of the mid-range fights and one of the less appealing of, the, of, of all of them. Um, uh, and again, this is not my opinion on the fight. It's just based on the numbers. I mean, neither guy reached the finish in a high enough clip. I guess Lee is okay because I'm just talking through this. If he's plus 200 and Madero's is plus 160, he is 200 less. So, I, you know, I, I, I view these guys very similar. They're both kind of average players. And I don't think Builder is ne is any better than Quinones. Let's put it that way. All right, so now we get to, uh, I think, one of the key fights. And that's uh, Garimbo versus uh, Pete Rodriguez. So he's 9,200, so we're expecting to see – I always refer to the, the favorite first. Um, so we expect to see him about a plus 200, minus 200 favorite, which he is. The thing is, is that we'll look at the inside the distance line, which I'm sure is okay. Wow. So Garimba has an inside the distance line of minus 115 or so, which is good enough given his price anyway. But if you also factor in the fact that he's going to be going for all the takedowns, uh, it makes him a, a, like kind of an elite play, right? So right off the bat, I mean, let's, we're going to throw him right in there as a very, very strong play. He's He's got a good inside the distance line, an elite inside the distance line, and he's going to do it in the right way, or he rates to do it in the right way. On the other hand, you have Pete Rodriguez, and here's my question. How often does he win this fight? Well, I don't know what. Plus, he's plus 220, so I guess about 30% of the time. But in those wins, I mean, don't you think that he's going to score well? I mean, look at his inside the distance line. It's sort of bananas here. Like, it's plus like 220. That's pretty much the same as his as his win odds, right? It's it's kind of nuts here. I mean, if you want to get him inside the disc, if you want to get him straight up, it's like plus two hundred five. You only get an extra like twenty cents if you play him inside the distance. So, Pete Rodriguez is in a weird way is kind of a super elite underdog here because I'm not saying he's going to win, but in his wins, which do occur thirty percent of the time, I mean he's going to score extremely well. So. I think that this fight is the first one where I think you you really want to get I don't want to say lock it in because you know we're not this is not really the the line of construction phase but let's just say they're both extremely strong plays. Uh, you don't want to play them together, but I mean, but just to remind ourselves, these are all very very good. Uh, all right, Azat Maxum versus Charles Johnson. So. Maxim is 8,900 versus Charles Johnson, 7,300. We'll just do a check on the money line. It's actually some line value for Maxim, right? Because you compare him to Garimbo. Well, he's a little less likely to win, but he's like 300 cheaper. But the thing is, is that he's got a very similar style edge here. I mean, he is going to presumably be going for all the takedowns and Johnson is all too happy, not all too happy, but apparently he gives him he gives him up quite a bit. So he is going to be an extremely strong play because in his wins, he's probably going to score really well. However, you know, his inside the distance line happens to be extremely poor. You know, it's plus 320 as a big favorite. I mean, I know I like to play the wrestlers in general, but I'd like to have some degree. Of, of, of finish up some, you know? So I think that Moxham is going to probably be somewhat popular. I think he's probably the weaker of these $8,700 wrestlers. We'll get to some others later. We'll put him in here for now. 
Maxim, but I, I think that Peterson is significantly better than than Maxim as far as the DFS plays. But because of his wrestling upside, I think he's he's in play. Um, Johnson on the other side. I mean, again, his win condition is going to be you know either winning a striking based decision, which is no good, or him somehow getting a finish and he's plus 700 to finish. So he's stream fade as far as I'm concerned. Molly McCann versus Diana Belbitsa. All right. So we're going to cut to the chase here. Um, when I went to the, the, the car to Toronto, uh, it was basically the subtitle was girl power <laughs> because the two women fighters on the slate, just the Canadians, just, just wrapped up all of the points. You had Jasmine Jazz, the vicious scored 160. And Raquel Pennington scored like 150. And all the male Canadian fighters busted, but but the two women fighters just, just broke the whole slate. And this week you have two women fighters who are probably gonna fade. Um, and one of them is gonna be uh, Molly McCann. But let's let's take a look at it. Um I mean the money line, she's minus two seventy. You know, she's ninety three hundred, fair enough, right? But at ninety three hundred, you gotta finish, man. You you gotta finish. And you got to wrestle pretty much. So you look at her inside the distance line, it's just really, really poor. You know, you have Molly McCann inside the distance is plus 260. That's atrocious. And she doesn't really have that much wrestling upside either, I don't think. So I don't know. Uh, she's going to be a pass for me. And Belbita just doesn't win often enough. And, you know, I think this whole fight's a fake. Gilbert Urbina versus Charles Radke. Um, there's all kinds of talk about this fight. I'm not going to get into all of it, but Urbina looked really good in his last fight, but then again, his opponent, Oski, was was completely dust. I mean, he almost you know, he almost pulled out of the fight. He was very, very unhealthy. So you could say that that fight was sort of fake. And then Radke, he got booed off the octagon in his last fight, even though he won. So you're hearing a lot of this recency bias talk about maybe, I don't know, maybe Urbina is not as good as his last fight, and maybe Radke is not as bad. It's, don't let all that confuse you. Let's just go straight to the numbers. Urbina minus 200. Let's see, first of all, he has money line value. He does not, 9K. So at 9K, what do we need? We've already talked about this. We need to have an inside the distance prop of about minus 110 or uh, a lot of wrestling upside. So let's get to it. Urbina, inside the distance. Plus 130. I mean, not bad. Not great. Um, so I guess I would... Well, I was about to say I have to kind of make him sort of average, but I do see in his last two fights, he did have two takedowns. Um, two takedowns, three minutes of control. Um... So because of that, he's going to have to step up and, and be part of the, of the conversation, you know? Uh, is he a good, a, as good a play of Garimbo? No. Is, is inside the distance line not, it's not quite as good? Then again, he is cheaper. So uh, I think that Urbina is actually a pretty strong play here. I didn't think that going in, but uh, again, the more you look at these numbers, it, the numbers really don't lie. I mean, they, they do. They, they kind of deceive. But when you're figuring out who the best plays are, I mean, this is a it, it is a very very strong. Uh, Radke, on the other hand, again, you know, for him to be a good play, he's got to have a strong inside. He's got to have some kind of inside the distance line, even like plus three hundred maybe. And actually, this isn't bad. So Radke inside the distance is only plus two seventy. All right, I'm I'm down with that. Okay, or plus two ninety. So here's he is another underdog. I'm going to play here. Um, so we've already found two fights. We're going to get to a couple more in a minute uh, where you could play both sides, not in the same lineup, but, but you know, that, that you could just take a stand on that somebody scores a lot. And uh, I think this one, I think the Radke side is going to probably go a little bit on your own as well. Uh, I, for, for a weird reason, I, I was about to say, I think people might play Rodriguez, but no, Garimba's going to be too popular. Um, but I think Radke is a pretty, very reasonable $7,200 underdog. So I like Radke and I do like, uh, repeat. 
All right, uh, Kiziev versus Mahmoud Maradov. Um, so you have Kiziev, it's minus 140. Uh, boy, oh boy, he's 8,800. That's not great, okay? That's some pretty nasty line value um, on Muradov. And boy, it's a real fishy one, right? Because you look at him, he's 14 and 0. I mean, he's 14 and 0. And he's, and there's money being sent in against him. Uh, that that seems very fishy. Um, we'll we'll talk about that in the betting breakdown, I guess. But uh, at eighty eight hundred at minus one forty, that's rough. The, the thing though is that he does have takedown upside. He's a Russian wrestler, uh, and boy oh boy, what's his inside the distance line? Let's take a look at this, Kiziev. It's only plus 140. Plus 140 plus the takedown upside. I have to say, I mean, according to the numbers, I mean, the play kind of stinks. I mean, I was thinking about this earlier. I thought this was going to be kind of an elite play here. You know, this Russian guy's 14-0. They're going to bring him over. He's going to get the takedowns and sub the guy, but. Well, I don't know. There's a lot of people out there that think that Maradona is going to win. And, and based on these salaries, uh, boy, fading Kiziev is going to be a pretty nasty uh, thing because he could get, well, you know, 120. But I think we have to stand, stick to our guns a little bit and fade him. Oh, God. Uh, I'll, I'll, you know what I'll do? I'll split the difference. I'll say he's kind of an average play, and we'll just leave it at that. Muradov on the other side. He's got, he's got certainly money line value. Let's look at his inside the distance line. Plus 500. Uh, it's not great. And I'll tell you something else. If he wins by decision, that's not going to look good either. I don't think. Because if he wins by decision, he's probably going to have to suffer some kind of takedowns. But maybe just win a striking base, you know, get some good judges. Ah, uh, this is a tough one, guys. Uh, it's going to be a really scary thing to suggest, but I think we're supposed to fade this fight. Gross. We'll see. Maybe I'll change my mind. I'll play. I'll play Kiziev at the end of the day, but we'll we'll see. Um. All right. Where are we? Viviana Rujo versus Nataliana Cristina da Silva. She's minus three fifty. Da Silva. Uh, and she is 9,500. So for 9,500, what do we need? We need everything. I mean, we need uh, not only a finish, but, but takedowns as well, or a first round finish. You know, even a first round finish might not be enough. I mean, you, you, to get there at 9,500, you got to really beat on your opponent, all right, for a while. And as I mentioned before, two weeks ago, the theme was girl power. You had these 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 women fighters who just broke the slate. Uh, I think I'm fading this one too. I mean, you look at the inside the distance line, and it just doesn't it doesn't hold up for a 9,500 hour fighter. She's plus 270 inside the distance, and she hasn't really shown that much grappling upside. Um, so unfortunately, she's just going to be a fade, which means probably that the whole fight's going to be a fade. God help. Anyway, uh, moving on, Randy Brown versus Muslim Salikov. It's kind of interesting. I mean, he's got some, yeah, Randy Brown with some money line value here. He's minus 280, and he's only 9,100. So in, um, whatchamacallit, in optimizers, he's probably going to show up just because of his, uh, of his money line value. But I just, he's got to also pass the test as far as is inside the distance line, because he doesn't really have much grappling. And when we look at his inside the distance line, I, as I recall, it's not going to be that great. I mean, it's yeah. I mean, plus two thirty. I mean, it's just a fade. It's just a fade. Now it's going to be low owned and we get to, yeah. So we could talk about that, but how low owned is he really going to be with a minus two eighty win odds? I mean, there, there, there are going to be, 
optimizers that prioritize win odds just get to him. So this fight is just going to be a fade. So I have a couple of fade fights, which makes this uh, makes this kind of cool. Um, Drew Dober versus Renato Moicano. This is going to be the fight, which I imagine you're going to want to have both sides of. But let's just take a look at it. Moicano minus 185. So I imagine that means he's going to be probably 8,600 or so. Only 8,400. Wow. This is, yeah, this is here, here, here we go. So this is what we're going to get. Number one, we have money line down. Number two, we'll pull up the inside the distance line. And your Moicano inside the distance is plus 160 or plus 130, which is really good for this price. In addition to that, he's got a lot of takedown upside against the guy who gets taken down. So this uh, is probably the best play uh, on the slate, I imagine. It's either going to, it's either, I think, Moicano or Peterson. I mean, there's some good, good plays here, you know. Peterson, Moicano, even Stuyorenko, I mean, given her win condition, the Rimbo. Um, but on this, in this particular fight, you have the other side. You have Dober, despite his money line not being great. I mean, you look at his inside the distance line. I mean, this is crazy. It's like plus 180. I mean, that's like amazing. I mean, that's what you expect on like an $8,300 fighter. And he's 7,700 or whatever he is. So 7,800. So this, this fight is kind of a lock, you know? Uh, either one of these two, either Dober or Moicano. Um, and just to remind ourselves, we also had Garimbo Rodriguez, Urbina Radke. That's a kind of a fun one, you know? Um, so that's one way you can play. Is you just take those key fights and just play 100% of them and just kind of filter the rest. But we'll, again, we'll talk about that when it comes to lineup construction. Um, and then we get to the main event, which is Imava versus Dolice. And um, these five round fights are tricky, you know, because they're they're always going to project well because you have five rounds, right? You're always going to have ownership because they project well. So you have to figure it out, you know. And, and so let's just go back to the numbers here. Let's look at uh, Imovov first. He's eighty six hundred. His line is plus minus one sixty, so that's about fair. But how is he going to win this fight? All right, well, let's take a look. Well, first of all, his inside the distance line is plus 160. That's not great. Okay. It's just, it's it's okay. But it's just not great considering that his inside the distance line is spread out over five rounds. You know, if he gets a fourth round KO, that's not going to score all that great, you know, for example. However, Imovov might have some takedown upside. Um, not only that, but in a, a five-round fight, he's going to have volume, which is going to add up. And all this is a way of saying that I think he's a, you know, he's a good play. He's he's not someone you got to lock in. And yeah, it's possible that six guys outscore him. You know, it's likely in a win he'll get around a hundred right between the take between the takedown possibility the volume over five rounds which plus the finishes i imagine in his wins he scores a hundred uh so he's he's fine he's fine he's gonna have ownership I, I would probably get pretty much whatever the field has on him which is probably going to be 40 percent. you know it, it does he is or maybe a little less, but he, he is a good play, but he's not someone I have to block him. Now, the other side of this, you have Dalit say his inside the distance line, I imagine, is just as good, right? So his inside the distance line is where is it? Um, I mean, it's that's ah, plus 200. I guess that's fine. You know what I mean? Like Dober's better, for example. You even even Rodriguez is better. Um, and he's only 7K. Um, and the other thing about Rodriguez is when he, if, if, if he gets a KO, he's going to get it in the first or second or third round. It's possible that Delice gets a finish without, you know, even without smashing, like maybe he gets in round four or something. 
And maybe Delice is getting kind of out volume the whole fight, and then he gets there in the fourth round or something. It doesn't even score that much in that in that variation. So I think Delice is okay. Uh, it's it's very similar to the way I feel about Imavov. I probably would put I would probably go a little under on Delice uh, than the field. Um, and that's pretty much it. You know, I, I, there again to review. There's some key fights to target and some key fights to fade and some middling ones. But just to kind of review, you know, I think Peterson's an elite play. I think that this Quinones fight is is you know like they say GPP only. You know, I, I, it's very average. Uh, Stoli Renko, the only side of this fight. Builder Lee, I consider similar to Madero's Quinones. Uh, you know, you have to get into many liners before you prioritize those. Rodriguez Garimbo, key fight. Uh, Moxham Johnson. Uh, I think Moxham's a little worse uh, than the than, than Peterson, for example. Uh, McCann, Pobita Fade. Urbina Radke, kind of sneaky good fight there. Kriziev, Muradov. I, I go back and forth in this one. I'm, I'm inclined to think it busts. What can I tell you? Uh Silva Arugio, pass. Salikov Brown, pass. Dober Morikano, load up, and Imavov Delice with the feet. That's that's my that's my DFS view of the plays without getting into advanced lineup construction, which we will get to in our next video, which is on Saturday. But hopefully, this gives you an idea of what uh, the good plays are.